Despair is dangerous. The lack of a path, of a light, brings out the worst in humanity. Surrounded by the eternal dark, I was presented with a way out of torment, and it was as if a weight had been lifted from my shoulders. Don't say anything. Just listen to me. If what I've heard about you is true, there's a chance. But I'll only tell you everything if you promise to take me with you. I'll withhold details as we travel to make sure you don't betray me. You'll do everything I say, how I say it, and when I say it. Well, the deal is off. Wait, travel? To where? The ninth circle of hell, of course. Where the one who marked you is eagerly waiting. There, he holds a passage to a higher plane, where perhaps one can attain a new body. A shock ran through my heart. A, a new body? A way out of here? Even if all of this is true, how do you suppose we escape from here? It's not like Jack will suddenly repent of his sins and set us free overnight. That part I'll leave to you. Think of it as a test of your abilities. If you can get us out of here, it will serve proof that you can handle the journey to the depths of the abyss. If we get caught, I'll know I was wrong about you. We didn't talk for the rest of the night. I couldn't sleep either. How could I? My mind was restless with the possibility of salvation, an escape route from all the pain. A new chance at life. I just needed to get us out of there, but how? Trapped in the catacombs without even the grace of seeing the city? I had no idea what things were like on the surface. I couldn't formulate a plan. At least, not alone. And patiently I waited, the days passing by, torturous and merciless. But in that moment, I had gained a frightening resilience. With something to cling to, hope had flourished again. I thought not even the corrupted shadows of the city could shake me anymore. Damn was I wrong. Finally, the day I had been waiting for arrived. You see, with so many slaves falling from excessive work and cruelty, an exchange would happen from time to time, and some familiar faces would appear when I was lucky. On that day, when the blindfold was removed, I had to hold back from showing my happiness. In the laboratory with me was John, tied to a wooden table in the corner grinding fungi with a leather mask, and in the middle, cracking open beasts' skulls with a giant hammer, was the gigantic man who had been captured with me. A long day followed, the smell of sweat, blood, and drugs intensifying with each passing hour. My eyes were keenly watching the movement of the guards, restless and anxious. It was almost a daily ritual, the moment they secretly entered the stockroom to evaluate the quality of the product. Precious few minutes when we were left alone. As always, the guards grew tired of the trembling and tapping feet and retreated to the stockroom, threatening us with the loss of our eyes if we told anyone. As soon as the door closed, I got up and went directly to John. As naturally as I could, I put on the leather mask and pretended to help him with the fun guy while whispering by his side. I don't have time to explain, but I might be able to get us out of here, and I need your help to do it. His callous hands stopped working dropping the equipment on the table. What? Nate, is this true? Don't turn to me. Keep working. Slowly, he returned to mashing the fun guy and sorting them into small bags. He was trembling, making mistakes. A hope in hell can easily shake anyone. What do you need? Information. You work outside too, don't you? Selling everything to the addicts who come from the lower city. But I don't know if I trust my life to anything that comes out of their mouths. That's something already. I need to know everything, even if it doesn't seem important. Please, tell me. Maybe we can. A heavy hand landed on my shoulder. 
that behemoth of a person was standing right behind me. He had heard everything. Even with the constant cacophony of the equipment, the incessant blabbering from the upper store, and the lower tone of our voices, he had listened. He knew we were trying to escape. I want in. What? A cripple in a pile of sticks. There's no way in hell you two are escaping this city without my help. If you want to do this, I'm coming along. If not, the guards will have a nice little surprise when they come back. I could hear footsteps approaching. His expression made his intentions clear. I had no other choice at the moment but to include him in the team. Damn it, fine. Information as much as you can get. When we meet here in the lab, we'll share everything we've discovered. Once we have a plan, we start taking action. The door opened, and the soldiers entered. Still with their masks down and their noses full of powder, each of us quietly in our respective places. In the following weeks, with the extra help, I was able to learn a lot about the flow of drugs and weapons in the city. The Greek god of a man is named Yuri, and when he's not in the lab, he spends his days carrying metal plates to the lower city until his feet bleed. With him, we discovered that about twice a month, the collectors go out in droves through the gates toward lust in search of fresh meat, and taking with them an absurd amount of metal to supply the numerous outposts scattered throughout the circle. John had discovered that a significant portion of the merchants in the Pleasure Zone used this expedition to transport a large part of their stock to the higher circles right under Jack's nose. On the night before the group's departure, the master's most valued slaves are chosen to carry box after box to a certain warehouse in the lower city. There, the collectors take their share of the deal and hide the goods in their cars before the day begins. The collector's parts are properly marked and the rest is supposedly not opened. In the darkness of the dungeon, my mind began to formulate a plan. If we could find a way to stay in the lab until the end of the shift, we might be able to infiltrate the merchandise and escape the Silver City through the front gate. There were still many problems. The merchandise was moved at night, precisely when we were taken to our respective dormitories. Our absence would surely be noticed, and how on earth were we supposed to even know which box would be moved to the warehouse and which would be sold the next day? If we were to do that, we needed more information, but we also needed to be quick. Up until that point, since the old man's arrival, Aseroth and Jack had left me alone. If they decided to do another torture session, the Archduke of Hell would claim domain over my mind again and know exactly what I was planning to do. I shivered, thinking about what horrors would await me after that. Each night before bed, I updated the old man on the progress of my plan, asking for details on exactly how we would escape from that cursed plane when we reached the ninth circle. But that bastard never said anything, just looked at me waiting for my next move. Afraid of losing the precious window that had opened for me, I foolishly decided that it would be better if we acted quickly and forced fate to smile upon us for a change. When I woke up in the laboratory the next day, I took advantage of the guards busy screwing with their own minds to tell my colleagues the plan. It was insane. But what in that pit of despair was coherent? On rare occasions, the old man graced us with his presence in the laboratory because of the agreement he had to come along. I gave the excuse that he knew of a safe place where we could rest if we managed to escape. It wasn't convincing, but what other choice did they have but to accept? When the four of us were working together, we would act. And thanks to John, I found out that we didn't always work the day shift in the laboratory. Every other day, we spent entire nights in that damned cramped place. If we caused a distraction, we could use the panic to invade the stock room and hide among the merchandise that would be mislaid. The slaves would take us to the warehouse, and from there, we would rely on luck for them to be too busy searching for us in the upper city to find us. We would have to leave before Jack was notified of our escape. With Aseroth by his side, there was no place in the city where we could hide. Luckily, 
nobody wants to be the one to bring bad news to the psycho. With the plan set, we began to act, having no idea the self-appointed king of hell was already well aware of our actions. The day I escaped from the Silver City was also the day I officially gave up my humanity while in hell. Hatred, anger, they consume the heart of everyone, from the purest to the most honorable. Not that I'm anywhere close to being either of those things. Even to this day, I still feel dirty, undeserving to be here now, and I know it all too well. But still, I do not regret the things I did to survive. The plan had started well, with all of us together in the laboratory feeling anxious with every passing second, my stomach churning, my hands trembling. I didn't know how to act normally anymore. I didn't want to raise suspicions. And so I hyper-focused on my work, waiting for the end of the shift. Cutting muscles from beasts, roaring ground of fungus powder with a meat-like texture, slowly being numbed by the sweet aroma that always hung in the laboratory. The sound of footsteps upstairs had been considerably reduced. One of the signs that the shop was about to close. I looked at Yudi and nodded. You know, the strange fungus that grows in the walls of the city has some interesting characteristics. They call it dead man's fiber. And to the touch, it's like touching a wrinkled skin. When ground and heated, a strange reaction causes it to become slimy and acidic. Sticking to human muscle, it devours it, generating a byproduct in the form of orange powder, the unrefined form of Scarlet Maiden. In this state, the drug is highly unstable, and upon contact with water, it rapidly increases its temperature, which can give you horrible burns. Or, if there's a sufficient amount, an explosion. Throughout the next day, little by little, we gathered five small bags filled with the byproduct, hiding them beneath the many empty bags scattered in the corner. When I nodded, Yudi slowly rose and headed to the pile. The soldiers had once again left to get high, so he quickly planted the powder bags around the boiler, attracting curious glances from the poor souls accompanying us on that shift. I hoisted John onto my back, the old man following closely behind and we positioned ourselves at the edge of the stairs. As soon as Yudi saw that we were ready, he lifted the water jug we received at the beginning of each day and threw it toward the boiler. Then, chaos. An explosion caused the floor directly above the boiler to collapse. Powder and chemical gases making it nearly impossible to see more than a foot ahead. Screams and cries of pain ensued. One of the slaves who accompanied us was caught in the blast. An iron pipe from the boiler had pierced his neck, pinning him to the wall. And the last customers of the shop above were caught in the flames that rose like a mushroom through the hole that opened in the floor. Soldiers hurried down the stairs to control the fire, not seeing us pressed against the wall. We quietly went up as soon as everyone descended to control the damage. John guided us to the stock room, we had little time until the merchandise was moved to be saved from the flames. I could already hear murmurs from outside. The distraction had worked. We had drawn attention. Perhaps too much of it. In the darkness of the stock room, it was hard to see anything. Dozens of boxes filled the space, mostly unmarked. We had no idea which ones to break into. What now? Did we just pick at random? You told us you had a plan. Yudi said, pulling at my shirt. Now's not the time for this, John said somewhere in the dark. Hell, just, uh, I, I don't know. Pry open one of the smaller ones. There's supposed to be a way for the collectors to know which one to pick. Maybe there's something inside. Look at how many boxes there are. The fire is already spreading. It won't take long till... Yudi was interrupted by a pound at the door. Open this door already. I want my powder safe and sound. Do you hear me? Useless bitch, hurry up. What little time we had was about to be over. I could faintly see scared eyes looking at me for answers in the dark. 
my heart was pounding, and I had just wanted to get out of there. I noticed a pile of boxes that was more isolated than the others. Without light, it was hard to tell, but with no other choice, I hurried towards them. The door was about to give in. We would have to rely on luck. We opened two boxes, put on the leather mask in an attempt to avoid inhaling too much of the drug, and split up, hiding within the merchandise. I stayed with John, trusting that Yudi would take care of the old man. The door gave in with a loud thud. Quick, you incompetence! I want every damn gram secured! And you, slut! Get two more and get this shit out of here now! If Jack shows up, he's gonna ask questions, and questions are ruining an honest man's business. The screams and footsteps, the smell of the drug making me dizzy, the smoke from the fire engulfing the shop. We were hurriedly moved to the elevator, and as I felt us descending, a wave of relief filled my heart. Through the small cracks in the wood, I could distinguish the lower city slowly growing larger. The plan was working as intended. I remember John smiling. Maybe it was the drug. Maybe it was the euphoria of the moment. But I remember being happy to have him with me. <sighs> I miss him. We were led to the warehouse, where they left the boxes and abandoned us in the dark. I could hardly believe how well the plan was going. Looking back now, I realized I was a fool. The collectors never checked the boxes. They just loaded them onto the cars. Before I could connect the dots, we were passing through the silver gates. Looking through the crack, I once again had the full view of that sin-ridden skeleton, and even as I moved away from it, I felt in my heart that I had already been touched by the city, and it tends to always reclaim what belongs to it. The truck that was carrying us headed towards the spire until the crown of the first circle was nothing more than a small dot on the horizon. And then, it stopped. Why now? Why haven't we reached the spire yet? Why stop now? John whispered nervously in front of me. Before I could respond, a chilling shiver ran down my spine upon hearing Mice's words. Well, I think the little show has gone on long enough, hasn't it? The lid of our box opened, and I could hear the pumping of a shotgun. Above, Mice and two companions grinned maliciously at us. Well, well... What do we have here? Jack's new favorite little toy and his buddy. You care to tell me what you're doing in my shit? Please, Mice, you can have the drugs. Just let us go. I pleaded. Mice laughed. Laughed so hard that his screwed up lungs gave him a coughing fit. After composing himself, he ordered us to be taken out of the box. Yudi and the old man were already kneeling in the sand with their hands on their heads. Oh, oh, oh. amazing. Oh, hold on, let me get this straight. You really thought your dumbass idea would work out so well? Holy shit, buddy, you're really stupid. L listen here. I'll tell you a little secret. Mice approached my face and pressing the shotgun barrel against my chin. You never would have found your little buddies again if Jack hadn't ordered it. What are you talking about? Oh, come on, use your head. Everything's so convenient, so perfect. Your whole plan worked it because Jack wanted it to. Your encounter with the old man... The information that reached your colleagues, the timings lining up, the guards leaving, all observed, all permitted. My face contorted in horror. Once again, I was nothing but a pawn, a toy of that maniac. 
Astaroth would always watch us. The king always controlling every miserable inch of his kingdom. Why? Why would he let us get this far? Something in your ultimate fate pleases him. If he can't extract any information from you, he'll just let you guide him to what he wants, won't he? But then, why stop us now? <laughs> ding, ding, ding! This is the question of the moment. Congratulations, idiot. Some neuron up there still works as it should. You see, I never cared about that mangy mutt. Jack is just a little baby who luckily gained a lot of power. If he's so afraid of what your mark represents like this, it means that you pose a danger to his empire. Through you, I'll have the chance to take the throne that has always belonged to me. Mice was interrupted by a sound, Yuri laughing as he watched kneeling. With a smile, Mice approached knelt in front of Yudi, carefully dusted the drug powder from his shoulders and asked, And what's so funny about that to you? It's nothing. It's just that you call us idiots. But if you think you can usurp the throne with two piles of muscle and a tough attitude, you're even dumber than you seem to be. The smell of gunpowder invaded my mind before I could process what had happened. I remember touching my head. Something was stuck in my hair. I lowered my hand and saw myself holding a loose tooth. I heard a howl of fear. But why fear? My ears were ringing. I couldn't think straight. Yudi was lying back. His skull sprawled across the sand, stained by a scarlet puddle. Oops, my bad. Loose finger and all that. You son of a bitch. I lunged towards Mice, the barrel of his gun slowly turning towards me. Ah, oh, no, 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 I don't think so. If you lot wish to stay alive and not get a one-way ticket straight to Lust, where we already have some scouts ready to capture you, I must point out, you will behave. All that just to become someone's toy again. I could hardly believe it. Looking at Yuri's body, I wondered if he had felt any pain. The harder I made it for mice, the better. Maybe if I were quick, I could escape the collectors in lust. But then, while I pondered, others acted. The old man lunged at one of mice's companions, biting his neck with all his might. The second one, startled, reached for his holster, but John quickly grabbed his legs, bringing him down to the ground. They were willing to fight, and to die for a chance. Mice turned the gun towards them, pumping the shotgun once again. Damn it, can't you do anything right? Stay still, I can't aim like this. I saw the opportunity, and grabbed the shotgun. A deadly tug of war ensued, and punches and kicks thrown in an attempt to take control of the weapon, the power to kill. I was malnourished, still weak, and tired and slightly high. Mice was an experienced collector, a bloodthirsty killer who had faced demons head on. It was only a matter of time before he overpowered me. I gave up pulling the shotgun towards me and pushed it with all the weight of my body towards mice. We fell and rolled in the dry sand, the gun stopping a few feet ahead. I crawled to the shotgun, mice holding on to my feet and pulling me into an exchange of punches. I don't know what came over me. All the anguish, all the fury and fear accumulated until that moment exploded into rage. I gave up on the gun and threw myself at mice, landing repeated punches to his head. Again, adrenaline is a powerful drug. Screaming, without full control of my arms, I punched. I punched until Mice's face was nothing but a red mess, until his arms stopped retaliating, until his chest stopped breathing. I continued until tears filled my eyes and sobs choked my throat. I looked at my hands. 
and the clear weight of what I had done became clear in my mind. Killing a person changes you. You can feel life slipping away from their eyes. Even in that place, where death is just the beginning of another cycle of pain, it still holds weight. The old man's screams of pain snapped me out of my trance. His efforts were admirable, but he was eventually thrown to the ground where the collector attempted to strangle him. I grabbed a shotgun, and out of pure instinct, I struck the collector's head with all my strength. He immediately fell onto the old man, the base of the gun now adorned with a red stain. Looking to the side, John was trying to wrest the gun from the collector without success. In the distance, I could see dust rising. We weren't alone. The king had noticed that something was amiss. The old man took the gun from my hands and opened a hole in the collector's chest, who collapsed like a house of cards onto the dry ground. The spire was visible. We needed to go. With John in my arms, I ran. Leave him behind. He'll do nothing but slow us down, the old man said. I could feel John's embrace tighten. He knew he was a burden. He knew what they would do to him if we let them behind. I could feel his fear. Ignoring the protests, I headed towards the spire. They were getting closer. I could discern the caravan amidst the cloud of dust. Upon reaching the spire, Aeacus's judgmental gaze bore down on us coldly. Remembering Mice's words, I approached. Oh, Aeacus, king of Aegina, my heart is not pure for rest. My eyes are blind to injustice, and my fists only weigh for my desires. From dust I came, and to dust I return, my soul judged to forever burn. So I beg you to open the doors to my judgment. His cold gaze remained unmoved. The spire would not heed my words. This won't work. We need to get to the lower circles. It would be incredible if we could get Radamanthus's attention, but at the top of hell, it's hard for him to hear us, the old man said. What do we do now? I've done my part. I got us out of the city. Do yours and take us to the ninth circle. The old man looked at me, his eyes burning with fury. For a moment, it seemed like there was a dark gleam in his eyes. He calmed himself and approached the entrance. The followers of the Morning Star follow his teachings in exchange for secrets and powers greater than a mere sinner could ever dream of. How to survive in such a ruthless terrain? How to tame and enchant demons and spirits? How to change oneself? The old man whispered words in a convoluted language forgotten by time. Aeacus began to chant in response, and the spire trembled in anticipation the chamber taking on a sinister glow. Without looking back, the old man said, A wish for a wish, a will for a gift, blood taken in exchange for bliss. What the hell are you? I asked. Nathaniel, you have a choice to make. Do you want to escape hell? Do you want your life back? Of course. Then John must Die. A chill ran down my spine. Nothing comes easy in the abyss. Only pain, only suffering. John begged for mercy, and in my mind, I knew what I had to do. The price Minos demanded for his services. The old man merely watched me. John fought, and struggled until the last second. He threw himself off my back and crawled through the sand and towards the caravan, which was slowly approaching. I'm sorry, John. I dragged him by the stumps of his legs into the depths of the spire. He tried to cling to the ground, breaking his nails in the process. I threw him against the inner wall, and in that moment, both of us could feel it. The spire would claim him. There would be no turning back. Death this time would be eternal. Nothingness would embrace him. I had to ensure he wouldn't escape. With tears in my eyes, I broke his arms 
His screams still haunt me. Even to this day, I suffer from it. Every morning, I hear his whispers. Every night, his screams keep me awake. I did what I had to do to survive. I wished there was another option. I wished so much that John was still by my side, but hell was devised in such a way that even something as simple as friendship is only allowed for punishment. I tried to be quick. With one of the rocks from outside, I broke his knees, turned around, and left. Nate, please, please, Nate, don't do this to me, you bastard. What did I ever do to you? I hope you suffer, you piece of shit. Burn a thousand times in the deepest pit of this place. When I left, a black mass flooded the chamber, and I could see as Nate was consumed by the spire. Until the moment they were dissolved, his eyes never stopped looking at me in that way, with palpable hatred. At that moment, I knew that everything I had suffered until then was justified. I belong in hell. I tried to warn you. I'm not a good person. The mass took on a purple glow, and the old man quickly pulled me inside. The last thing I saw before disappearing was the red glow of Jack's ring approaching in the caravan. The air in the heresy is putrid. A constant miasma floats in the air like snowflakes, slowly filling your lungs and eventually killing you. Outside the spire, in the center of the sixth circle, I noticed for the first time a strange mark on the back of my left hand. A delta adorned with thorns. But at that moment I couldn't focus on it. All I could do was cry. Huddled near the spire, wondering if it was all really worth it. Let's go, he doesn't like to wait. Who? He looked at me, with a somber look in his eyes. Samael, the morning star. The true lord of hell. These memories pain me. My hands tremble. And my eyes fill with water. Making it difficult to write. I also still haven't fully recovered from the beating I took from that angelic being. So for today. We'll have to stop here. A hell is an eternal prison where everything and everyone are made in place in such a way that at any moment they can be used against you. Only pain will bring you a semblance of security. Only agony will bring you power. In this insane realm of trades, I should have known that even the way out would exact a terrible price. I don't have much time. That bastard, I should have known he had something else up his sleeve. The door could give way at any moment. All I can do is pray that Father Nick arrives soon. The stained glass windows of the church showed distorted images of Gehenna. A profane choir of agonized voices fills my ears as hundreds of shadows surround the chapel. He is coming. I don't have much time left. This might be the last time you hear from me, so please pay attention. You need to know this. You need to know that last car that treacherous serpent has up his sleeve. It's finally time to recount my escape from hell. My lips quiver as I speak this out. I must be grateful to at least have a way to record my final thoughts. At the moment, I'm cornered beneath the podium of the Chapel of the Saint of Lost Causes, a forgotten structure far from the city. But in recent days, it has become one of the few places where I could find some peace of mind. After the encounter with the angel, many questions arose in my mind coupled with the increase in shadows surrounding and watching me, and the nightmares disrupting my rest, I felt it was time to seek some kind of help. 
My relationship with churches has been complicated since I returned from the dead. When I decided that I would do everything possible to avoid going back, the first thing I did was head to the nearest Catholic church. But uh, as I knelt before the steps of the entrance, I felt an unusual chill run down my spine. At the entrance of the church stood a statue of an angel above the door. I could recognize the imperfections and marks that only human hands can produce, but something in its gray eyes alerted me. I felt as though I was once again under the cold and judging gaze of Minus. With each step I took, the discomfort grew, as if I knew I no longer belonged in that place, that there was no room in the light for me. Before I could reach the door, I turned around and ran away, only stopping when I was out of sight of that damn statue. Since then, every attempt has had the same effect, which confuses me. Forces beyond my comprehension have strangely pushed me towards these sacred grounds, like the taxi incident. It's as if two parents were fighting, each trying to influence a neglectful child. I felt tossed around, caught in the crossfire of beings so ancient and with such mysterious intentions. An ant in a field of giants. And I would have continued this tug of war if it weren't for Nick, Father Nicholas. Our meeting was a twist of fate. I was stuck in the hospital's medical wing, trying to rationalize the events that had left me bedridden, and he entered my bedroom by mistake thinking I was one of the soon-to-be-dead patients awaiting my final prayer. It took a while to convince him otherwise. That simple mistake probably saved my life, even not being the one he was searching for. Father Nick felt something in me. He insisted on praying for my soul nonetheless. As I closed my eyes, a foul stench filled the room. It got cold. I could hear a high-pitched buzzing swirling around, like a swarm of angry wasps searching for a victim. When I opened my eyes, I saw the shadows stretching across the walls, forming the faces of horrendous beings with insects with wings and twisted horns, thin tails covered in spikes and bifurcated claws that tore at the wallpaper as they moved. The shadows danced in an unholy festival, mocking me, reveling in my suffering, even though the horror consuming my mind was overwhelming, my skin as pale as snow and my heart pounding, begging me to flee, the scream of terror that echoed through the ward didn't come for me. For the first time, I wasn't the only one seeing demons. Father Nick clutched his cross so tightly I swore his fingers would fall off from lack of blood. I recognized pure fear in his eyes. But even in the face of the irrational, that man didn't abandon me. With one hand on my shoulder, he told me to cover my eyes and pray. Even when the laughter grew louder, when the equipment toppled over and the lights flickered, we didn't stop praying. Who knows how long we stood there, pleading for the benevolence of a higher being. When everything finally calmed and we dared to open our eyes, the room was completely destroyed. Nick managed to get me out of there before the nurses arrived. In the days that followed, he helped me a lot. I didn't tell him everything, but he had seen firsthand that the Abyss had its eyes on me, and as a man of God, he couldn't allow himself to ignore that. It was weird. Throughout my journey through the Nine Circles, it was hammered into my mind that I would always be alone, that if I didn't betray the sinners first, they would betray me. Even when I ignored all the warnings and dared to extend a hand, I lost those who accompanied me. I don't deserve to be back. I don't deserve any help. But Nicholas was persistent, and his words, practically torn from the Bible, were spoken with such conviction that, even knowing the light had long abandoned me, I couldn't help but feel slightly touched by them. Even when I pushed him away, he always returned, asking me to visit his church. The doors are always open to those in need, he repeated. Hearing now the sound of wood creaking, the storm worsening, I can only hope that tonight they remain firmly shut. 
the time of my second trial is approaching. And I have the feeling that this time I won't be able to escape my sentence. So pay attention because if, when death finally catches up to you, you find yourselves thrown into the tar pits and torture from hell, you'll want to know how to escape this cruel fate. But be warned, it won't be easy. If I close my eyes and take a deep breath, I can still remember. I can still feel the foul air of heresy accumulating in my lungs, the constant miasma piling up on my back like snow hot as embers, the muddy ground that clings to you and the terrible sight of the abyssal wardens. As I walked through the sixth circle, my emotions erupted within me. I feel dirty, rotten. I just followed the old man without saying anything, occasionally looking at the delta on my hand. John's furious gaze still weighed on my memories, and the vision of Yudi's splattered brain surfaced every time I closed my eyes. I didn't even know why I was so determined to escape anymore. It was only fair that I suffer in that eternal cycle of agony. The swampy ground gave way to cracked and torturous terrain, the spire becoming just a small strip on the horizon. Around us, a new scene unfolded. The sixth circle is primarily composed of obsidian towers reaching up to the sky, with thick, twisted branches complementing them like lights on a Christmas tree. These towers house caves at their lower points, where sinners are held captive by hideous creatures, the true wardens of the abyss. The old man motioned for me to crouch, his expression revealing the level of danger we were in. My curiosity fought against my guilt, and winning, compelled me to peek. Knowing what inhabited that circle, it only made my anxiety worse. The warden's bodies resembled that of a centaur, with a lower part like a horse, irregular hooves, and defined muscles. Their tails are like living fire, spreading flames wherever they go, glowing with energy when they hunt, torture, and devour their prey. From the torso up, they resemble a locust, with four double-jointed arms covered in bristles ending in a single claw that twists like a scythe. Their black eyes sense fear, and if you stare at them for too long, you enter a state of paralysis. The exhilaration of this moment is such that the entire horde of wardens gathers for the feast, and you'll remain conscious throughout the entire process. You'll fear their jaws open your abdomen, their limbs tear yours apart, their faces chew yours, and you'll only return to the tar pits when there's nothing left that can be defined as you. In summary, stay away from the dark prisons. Unfortunately for us, our fate loomed just beyond them. Listen here, we need to mask our scent. These specific demons have an incredibly keen sense of smell. After that, we'll cross the valley. What? Did you see the size of those things? Can't we go around? The old man turned to face me. Look around. This field seems to stretch to the horizon. We're not in a fixed location. These prisons form and move at their master's will. The perfect tool for the perfect job. It's like a compressed bubble of murderous intent. There's no going around. You suck it up and face it head on. Or do you prefer to wait until that maniac catches up with us? Jack, stop talking nonsense. He's in limbo. And by the time he's halfway here, we'll be long gone. Damn it, kid. Jack ain't a novice like you. He's been here for centuries. He knows paths and highways that many have never heard of. And you forget who he is, who he believes himself to be. Or do you not remember what we did? We spat in the face of that damned self-proclaimed Emperor of the Abyss, whose ego and greed are so immense that he even managed to control a demon prince. Do you think he'd give up so easily? I wouldn't be surprised if he's already setting foot in heresy as we speak. 
my last sight before being swallowed by the spire reshaped in my mind. Jack's enraged face, his ring glowing intensely red, Astaroth's shadow looming over the caravan. Damn it, show the way. The old man crawled to a small mound of miasma, grabbed a handful, and began smearing himself with it. The smell was strong. I could see his face contorting with pain. With little choice, I did the same. My face bubbling with pain, struggling not to scream, and tears streaming so heavily I could barely keep my eyes open. Armed with only a handful of hope and hearts full of dread, we began to sneak past the Black Towers. With every scream I heard, I tightly closed my eyes, believing we would be next. The screams and cries punctuated by the stampede of hooves, the pleas for help from sinners trapped like birds in cages, so close that sometimes I could distinguish their faces and catch a glimpse of the sadistic tortures they endured. Occasionally, the wardens would release some sinners, letting them run far, letting them dream of a semblance of freedom only to cruelly hunt them down later. Like a mischievous ritual, where the only reward was capture and sometimes death. In one such instance, a lady fell near the rocks where we hid. One of the wardens cut her knees and watched as she crawled futilely, begging for mercy. I couldn't bear to watch it to the end. My stomach churned with disgust. The cruelty was such that many bit their tongues in a futile attempt to escape the demon's clutches. But something in that valley held them. Their bodies fell limp in their cells, only to rise minutes later. After hours of hiding behind rocks, holding our breath as packs passed by, and suppressing cries of pure fear and despair when the demons approached, we could finally see the end of the Black Towers. My left hand started to itch. The mark now glowed red. Confused, I looked to the old man for answers, but he angrily ignored me. Stop this shit. I've said a hundred times I never wanted anything to do with any of this. I just want answers. You said you'd tell me more as we traveled, right? And spit it out. I felt the tension release from my shoulders as we set back onto the cold, muddy ground. In the distance, a cluster of immense rocks stretched out lonely atop a hill. For some reason, I felt afraid. The mock is reacting to his presence. Samael is cunning and incredibly smart. Even imprisoned in the depths, he still holds ways and means to know what goes on in his realm. Gehenna is just a small part of the whole that makes up his soul, his essence. His body extends beyond what we can see, even in this cursed dimension. At this point, the mark's glow intensified, and the back of my hand started to burn. It's as much a part of him as he is of it. No matter how hard you fight, it's impossible to escape yourself. Uh, what the hell? My hand! The old man began pulling me towards the rocks which started trembling as if they were alive, waiting for me all this time. That's why he needs a new body, one that ain't eternally sealed to this plane. For centuries he sought the perfect vessel, the creature worthy to bear his new and perfect form, the true messiah, the one and only god of this world. And he found her, after much searching, he found her. Above the stars, the ritual was performed, the wound cursed with the presence of his only son. What the hell are you implying? This is madness. This, this, this is... The wait is over. Your mission is unique and imperative. Your body was meticulously crafted for this moment. All of us, humble servants of the Morning Star, dreamed of the moment where we would willingly surrender our bodies so that his eternal kingdom could begin. It pains me to give up this beautiful dream, 
but I tremble with happiness, knowing that in any case he'll be free. Come closer, Nathaniel. Your father and lord awaits you. I'm sorry, but I had to admit this fact. Until now, I can barely believe it. I don't want to believe it. Everything I went through, everything I suffered, no matter how I had lived my life, even if Holly were still alive, even if none of that had happened, my fate was set in stone. It made from stardust and the devil's wrath, with the sole purpose of bringing him to earth and sowing destruction. I am the fucking Antichrist. And at that moment, I was about to meet my father. The old man pushed me into the center of the rocks, which spun around, creating thick black smoke around us. The mark extended down my arm, invading my veins, pumping poison into my heart. I screamed, cried, begged for an end. I didn't want to go. The terror that filled me was so great that I could hardly realize that indeed we were being followed. Jack's plan had suffered a setback, but at no time had I failed to do what he wanted. I escaped Limbo. I led him to the Sixth Circle, and now I would lead him to the only one who could oppose his reign. Before my consciousness shattered into a thousand pieces and was carried away by the winds towards the deepest point of hell, I could see two silhouettes throwing themselves into the whirlwind of shadows. We had brought company. I want you to try to imagine the deepest darkness. Think of the emptiness of space. The vast expanses of incomprehensible sizes that harbor nothingness for billions of light years. Think of the deepest point of the ocean, where life barely exists, where sunlight is mere folklore, and only cold and loneliness accompany you. Pride is lonely. A space, a confinement so small and insignificant compared to the other circles, yet so much crueler. Only cold and nothingness in every direction. You are completely forgotten by creation. Light rejects you. Your senses abandon you. Your consciousness is crushed and compressed into an infinitely small space yet containing a vastness that harbors nothing. All the great beings of hell share the natural terror that haunts life. The entropy that carries everything away. Some like the succubus, even use it to hunt. But here, in the central point of the cyclone of hopelessness, in the maximum security wing of this prison, nothingness is thick and eternal. Yet, we're talking about God's former favorite angel here. There's a card up the sleeve. Even this deepest point of hell is still part of Gehenna, it's still part of his body. Although there's no physical space to contain the soul, even demons can dream. And when I opened my eyes, I found myself inside Samael's dream, face to face with the embodiment of evil. Beside me, I could see Jack and the strange girl who always seemed fascinated by me, the old man kneeling just ahead, all completely fascinated. The devil, after all, is extremely beautiful. The body of a model with long, golden, silky hair, eyes red as rubies, and beautiful white wings. Even in the face of such beauty, I could sense whom I was about to speak with. Like a gazelle before a lion, I was nothing to him. Just a weak flame of a candle that could be extinguished at any moment. Long minutes passed until Samael smiled and extended his arms. Nate, my beautiful child... I've longed to meet you. Why don't you sit? We have much to talk about. As if by magic, a table and two chairs appeared in front of me out of nowhere. Samael sat down. But what about them? I said, pointing at the other three, who strangely hadn't moved a muscle since I woke up. They won't bother us. Our conversation is just father to son. Carefully, I sat down, and in that moment, two glasses appeared. Samael lightly touched the mouths of both, and wine slowly filled them. Incredible, isn't it? 
If you want, I'll teach you how. I know what you want with me. Samael brought the glass to his lips, slowly sipped the wine without taking his eyes off of me, and spoke again with a fond smile. Nate, don't take the daydreams of a stuttering old man so seriously. All I want for you is to have a better life. What do you mean? You see, your grandfather was very cruel to me, and this fate, as you can see over the last few decades, also affects my entire lineage. But unlike him, I love you, Nate. I truly love you, and I only wish that you could return to the earthly world to enjoy a sincere life. I could feel the sincerity in his words, an intense love that only a father could have. But in the depths of my mind, a small part of my self was screaming, completely terrified. If you only want my good, why am I still here? Do you know how much I've suffered since I died? If what you say is true, I shouldn't have even fallen here to begin with. Nathaniel, use your head. I do have some control over my body, but I'm in prison. And what power does a convict have over the cell that holds him? Unable to answer, I brought the cup to my mouth and slowly drank. It was sweet and warm, and as it went down my throat, the taste changed to intangible things. A summer sun, a mother's embrace. Let's face it, if you don't have control over Gehenna, how do you plan to get me out of here? For a few moments, I swore his perfect teeth were twisted and sharp, but he returned back to normal as if nothing had happened. To get out of hell, one must rewrite one's name in the Book of Life. Beyond this circle, there is purgatory, where the book rests. But only with a tangible body can you manipulate it. The way it is now, even if I sent you there, it would be useless. A plate of grapes materialize in front of us, and Samael invited me to try them. While I satiated my hunger with the taste of the stars, he continued to speak. But if you allow me, I can give you a part of my consciousness, and with that you should be able to manage a new body. My heart was racing. Perhaps because of the food, perhaps because of the presence in front of me. But I felt strangely lethargic, compelled to accept. But something in that friendly smile gave me a terrible feeling. I needed to be smart. Looking around once more, I laid eyes on the strange woman. And in that tense moment, the pieces came together in my mind. Wait, she... she can't be... Holly? How could I not recognize her? Her plump lips. Her eyes once so full of hope and dreams. Even now, after decades of torment, her curves still drove me crazy. There was no doubt it was the same Holly I fell in love with. The same Holly I killed. Looking at Holly's body and the ring still glowing on Jack's hand, I had an idea. Cruel and insane. But at this point, after going through so much, it was worth a try. Like many of you, I also know the tales and stories. The deals with demons and otherworldly entities. If I really was my father's only hope of getting out of hell... Perhaps he was desperate enough not to notice a few details. Say, uh, Dad, I wish to make a deal. What do you think this is, a business meeting? What more could you possibly want? I pointed towards Holly, still standing perfectly still in the middle of the void. The love of my life. If I'm going back, I want a chance, a new life, and she has to be a part of it. The Morning Star laughed. <laughs> oh, Nate, you amuse me. If my son wants to screw, I have a lot of followers upstairs who would be delighted to. I cut him off by getting up from the table. I don't want just any whore, I want my Holly. I don't care about everything else. For a second, I could feel his anger on my body. I thought I was going to be dismantled, but after a few moments, he just smiled. 
but of course. A girl and a new body. Does that suit you? Slowly, I walked towards the three still paralyzed men. Samael's gaze on my back. I put my hands on her cold face and kissed her. It's all I want in the world. Samael smiled, stood up, and walked towards me. Without realizing that with my free hand, I had discreetly taken Jack's ring off. What followed was pure chaos. The Archduke of Hell is ancient and powerful. Astaroth follows no one, guided only by his hate and will, a will that was trapped inside the ring. As soon as it was removed, Astaroth saw an opportunity to get rid of it and take revenge for centuries of servitude. He forcefully invaded Lucifer's dream. The angel's presence destabilized Samael. A breach was formed, and an intense, pure light. But I couldn't escape like that. Not without a body. When Astaroth manifested, piercing Jack's chest with his hand and consuming him entirely, I put the ring on without a second thought. A scream of hatred invaded the Oniric realm. Samael grew in size, his beautiful torso twisted into a thousand facets. The devil, Satan, the seraphim, Beelzebub, Baal... Fury, hate, and malice. I could feel my mind burning, the mark of the beast growing again on my arm. I was about to be reformed. Myself would be stolen and made a husk for primordial evil. Focusing my attention on the ring, in a cry of fury I commanded, Aseroth, surrender and become mine. May your life become my flesh, your blood my support, and your will my vision. The Archduke tried to fight, but against the will of the ring, nothing could be done. And Samael could only curse me as I merged with the fallen Celestial and headed for purgatory. My last vision was the face of Jack, Holly, and the old man, fated to be trapped forever in Samael's nightmare. The next thing I knew, I was naked, digging my way out of the earth in the middle of a storm. I think you know the rest. I've done everything I can to escape my father's clutches ever since, and to get into my grandfather's good graces and escape Gehenna. But no matter what I do, no matter how hard I fight, my fate seems to be sealed. On this terrible night, I feel that something has changed. Somehow he's getting closer. The shadows of the chapel are chanting his name. The candles are going out. The cross is beginning to rust. My hope is that Aseroth's invasion has weakened my father's control. Perhaps now the way to purgatory is clear. For the first time in millennia, the prison is unguarded. Nicholas doesn't answer my messages. He said he could baptize me, you know? And today I would be reborn as a true child of God but something tells me he won't return. Hell is an eternal prison that holds creepy beings and the worst of humanity. But now, it's imperfect. There is a way out, if you're strong enough to find it. I promise that my father won't have my body, no matter what. I'll do everything I can to make sure that doesn't happen. The water is already prepared. I'll try to baptize myself. But if that doesn't happen, it was good to share my memories with you all. May hell never take hold of your souls. <laughs>